maybe we should start with uh, introducing the instructor. So my name is Arvan Bast, teaching here today from Tromsø, Northern Norway. R really looking forward to talk more about Git. Git is one of my really favorite tools. I use it every day. And this workshop is one of my favorite things in the year. And with me is Bjorn from yeah, Hello. Uh, my name is Bjorn Lindy. I'm working at NTNU. So I've been with the Code Refinery project almost from the start. So uh, I'm looking forward to teach today. And what I should do is I should take the screen share. Give me a second. And we will start with a, a little bit of recap before we go into the first exercise. We have today three exercises planned. And I will just arrange my screens. This page that I'm sharing is the introduction to Git, where we started yesterday. If you join today, no problem. Oh, we will get you up to speed. You can navigate the page either on the left side. Now, just for the readability, I will zoom in and I will tell you what did we do yesterday. Yesterday, we started with motivation and then we did three episodes, three exercises. One was to copy and browse an existing project. And if you don't have it, no problem, you can, you can copy it today. We have then instructions on how you create this copy, how, do you, how to create the fork. And then we practiced uh, creating commits and creating branches. And finally, yesterday, we practiced how to combine these changes in through merging. And many of you have even sent so-called pull requests towards the upstream repository. And this was a start to, so you have seen how collaboration essentially works, but we will return to collaborating tomorrow. The plan for today is we have three sessions planned. Again, three episodes, three exercises. One will start in 15 minutes. And here today we will move from, from the web to our computer. We will clone our repository to our computer and work locally. And then you can choose your favorite track. You can work with VS Code, our studio, command line, and hopefully in future we can offer even more tracks. In order to work locally, you will need to have an editor and we have recommended in doubt, go for VS Code or the command line configured. So this is something that you have hopefully done before the workshop. If not, not a big problem. You can then during the exercise sessions, look at the section, how to configure git for the, for your command line or for your editor if you use vs code there is very little to do basically download install and you are ready to go so i will not go through this episode but you know that it is there if you need it and you might need it in the first exercise we will so then we will clone work locally some of you those of you who yesterday worked in a command line or in a, in an editor, you have already worked locally. So there will be a little, a little bit of repetition, but there will also be new things. So then try to focus on the new things that come up. Um, try to focus on seeing the difference between what is a local branch, what is a remote branch, how does it work? And then we will do a little bit more archeology. span We will give you a puzzle to to do archaeology in somebody else's repository. And there we will practice some of the history inspection commands that we have already seen yesterday. Then we will take a longer break. And in the third session, we will take a different project. It can be your own project, or it can be your own new fantasy small project, which is not on Git. And we will practice how do we turn, make it a Git repository, and how do we share it on services like GitHub. 
which is incredibly important that we all know how to do it in order to make our code findable, but also in order to have backup. And as always, we, the instructors, we are watching these these collaborative notes. The more questions we get, the better it will be. I have a different screen where I have it open at all times. And the best way to interact then is to ask questions and comments at the bottom of the document. And Bjorn and me will watch this and and some of some of the questions we will then also discuss here on stream. So we really look forward to that. So please keep them coming. And now I recommend that let's go into this part here, cloning our Git repository and working locally. And let's start with our, let's get you started there. And also a little with a little recap. So I will go in here and you find the link uh, at the bottom of the collaborative notes. Our objectives are we are able to clone a repository from the web and modify it locally. We can do the same things we did before, like committing, branching, merging, but locally. But those of you who have done that already, we will also get a feeling for what are remote branches and remote repositories. And a little recap, what is a Git repository? What are we cloning? A Git repository contain, contains all the files and directories of a project. It has a complete history of all the changes to these files and directories. And each commit is a snapshot of the entire project at a certain point in time. And it has this unique identifier and we call it the hash. So if I go into, this is my, this is my practice repository from yesterday. And if you don't have it yet, no problem. You can then create it later. And what I meant with hash are these, this this thing here. This is my latest commit, and it has the identifier nine C two A seven E six etc etc etc. It's unique. And now, if I wanted to publish my work in an article, I could say that I have used this repository and I have used this particular version. But you will probably tag it. And I'm not using the, use, use the hash, I guess. Great point. Because for humans, for computers, this is nice. But for humans, it's hard to remember this, uh, these characters. So we often like to create so-called tag or a release or what I would pro probably have done. And let's just, let me just do it. So this is not something you need to do. You can try it later on your own repository. But what I will do here, I will create a so-called what GitHub calls release. But from the Git perspective, it's really a tag. And here, it's nothing else than creating a little sticky note with something that humans understand, which sticks to that commit. Let me create it quick. So create a new release. I'm here with my mouse on the right side of the screen. Create a new release. Here I can decide from, from where. If it's from main, it means it will be from the latest commit that is currently on main. How should I call it? I don't know, version 1.0. Uh, first version of my project, first working version of my project with many nice recipes. Okay, I can give it a title if I want to. Uh, publish release. And now this is what humans can remember it more easily. And this is what I can put in my manuscript. But it's, it's really just a sticky note with a little bit of metadata that points to a particular commit. And the, the typical metadata would be release notes, a short summary of what has changed in 1.0 compared to 0 0.9. The source code is easily available now since it's uh, zipped or torn. Yeah, that's nice. So it creates these, 
it creates this uh, archive for me, which people can download. So they don't even have to know how to use Git. They don't have to know how to clone. We will learn that now, but they can download this um, directly. Um, now, whether this is enough to be findable and reproducible for the next 10 years is a different question. So what we will do next week is we will show you how you can go a step further because I could publish my work, but I could still delete this repository and then it will be hard to find. A, a nice next step could be to make this citable, create a digi digital object identifier and make it persistent to make sure that this never disappears. But we will learn that next week. Beyond, how do you use Git in your in your work? Uh, I use it for almost everything. Uh, I try to be totally text based, just uh, only use simple text uh, and simple text editors, and then Git is very useful for uh, taking versions of, of what I produce. That goes for written text, configuration files, and, and code. Uh, what do you find, or uh, do you, if what did you find difficult with Git when you started? What was the most surprising, difficult thing? The more I, th I think branching and, and merging, uh, getting getting a getting a readable graph out of of mm. uh, of the branches and and then be at the right place to merge. So. Uh, so I've done a little bit of backtracking for getting uh, graphs that are more readable. What about you? Yeah, thanks. Um, what I found difficult at the, at the start was it was never so clear to me. Okay, I learned how to make commits and I could create commits and branches, but I didn't know whether they stay on my computer or whether they travel somewhere else. No, well, that yeah. was never very clear to me. And I think we will clarify that today. So we will create commits, but we will see that everything we do locally stays locally on the computer. Unless you tell it to uh, to go somewhere else. So something we will see is that we will have to actively push changes if I want to publish them from my computers to somewhere else. And, and also if if the GitHub repository gets new changes, they don't automatically magically travel to my computer. I have to actively pull them. So we will learn about pulling changes, pushing changes. And in a little bit, we will do a clone. And maybe one thing we could try is that just to show you what how this works, maybe one of us uh, could do it in the terminal and the other person could try it in VS Code. Um, and where we clone our, uh, or I, I can show both, doesn't matter, uh, where we clone the, the exercise from yesterday so that you have a starting point on your computer. And then the rest will be, there will be an exercise with a couple of steps. And like yesterday, there is no expectation that just by reading the exercise, you know the solution the solution and the walkthrough is part of the exercise. And then also in the solution and walkthrough, you, you, you then find also discussions and some thoughts. I'm also looking here at the questions, anything we should lift to general discussion. So there are some questions about releases, but they are answered. Um, should I show how to clone just to get us started? How how to do a clone uh, in in the terminal and how to do it in VS Code? Yeah, I or think that's a good idea. Then we'll had get a good start. Yeah. So that is you don't have to do it now. So for those listening now, uh, it's part of the exercise, but to show you what what that means and what's going on. And I will take I will take the my example from yesterday, if you don't have it, no problem, you can, it is forked from another repository. And if you don't, you can fork it again. If you, if you haven't done it yesterday, you can, there is a step that shows you how to do that. And I want to now 
clone it to my computer. Cloning means copying everything, but this time not from one user space into another user space, but cloning means copying everything from now GitHub down to my computer here. I will show you first uh, terminal in the command line. And then I will show you that in VS Code. And I will be a little bit clumsy in VS Code. It's not something I use every day. I use the command line every day, but that is good. It will slow me down a little bit. I will show you how I clone. And down here, hopefully you can see my command history. I'm... The way I clone is that there is this green button here. And here you can decide how you want to clone. And if you are unsure, that's then you can find the answer in this. Whoops, zooming out. Up here, configuring Git command line and editor. So this is part of the configuration. In my case, I have done that, and I will choose SSH. It's a way for me to authenticate that. <clears throat> oh, if you are in, in for this first exercise, this one will work as well. So it doesn't matter which of the two. What I do is I copy this address, and then on the command line, <clears throat> and we have the instructions. It's git clone, git clone the address. And then where do you want to clone into? For instance, recipe book. And this would create a new directory on my computer called recipe book. If I leave it out, then it will create a directory called with the same name as the Git repository. I will show you that on the command line. You can practice later if you want to, but you can choose your own journey. Here, OK, I received lots of objects and deltas. Uh, it just, and now I have a new directory on my computer called recipe book recorded. And in that directory, git log one line, I have a, I have a git repository. All the commits are there. All the branches are there. One interesting thing you can try later is that if I type git branch to see which branches do I have on my computer, I only see main. That might be surprising because on GitHub, zooming out, on the GitHub, I have four branches. But part of the exercise is to find out what's going on there. They are, all four branches are actually on my computer, but I don't want to spoil it. So in the exercise, you will see the difference between what is a local branch and what is a remote branch. And now let me try the same thing in VS Code. Should I try it or Bjorn, do you want to? No, I'm, I'm more, no, no, do it too. I'm not that used to as VS Code. Ah, yeah, me neither. I was hoping you would take it, but uh, let, me, <laughs> let me try. Okay, let me, let me see. So I will, just navigate out of this. And now I will have a sneaky peek at our instructions <laughs> on how to do that. But let me first try, um, I will make this, let me, I will start VS Code. I started by typing code and where do I want to start it? Code dot, but you might start VS Code differently, but it's how I started. I just want to start it in exactly this place. Oh, it's very small. Let me zoom in. Oof. Okay, I see that there is this other repository, but I don't want to be here. I want to start something new. I will start a new window. And I will close this one. Now oh, and I will close everything. Okay, let's try again. And we will choose exit. Yes, I did the wrong thing. No problem. I wanted to do new window. And in the other one, I should do close window. Here we go. So I have kind of an empty looking 
VS Code. And now what should we do? We should, one way to clone it is to go under start. Where is start? There is no start. Ooh. I hope I see something here on the source code the control. Aha, source control clone repository. No update right now. I will go on clone repository and now I can choose where do I want to clone from and Hmm. Will it work if I do github.com past cp book? You could just paste the URL, I guess, in oh, there. Yeah, I could. I could. So from here, from the green button, huh? Yeah. I will try what happens if I do. If I do it, if I just type it from the browser, I'm curious whether it will work. I think it might. Recipe book recorded, enter. And now I think it asks me where do I want to clone into. So I know that this is outside of your screen. Uh, where do I want to go into course? And I will give it a different name. I know you cannot see this because I don't want to reveal everything on my hard drive. Uh, I will call it recipe book BS code create and select this repository. And now I got an error message. Uh -huh, so that doesn't work what I wanted to do. Okay. Let's try again and let's do it properly. So now clone repository. And now instead I should do, I should take it from here. Hmm? HTTPS, copy this, clone repository here. Yes. And now again on into the right place. Why did you choose HTTPS over SSH this time? Hmm. I wasn't sure whether okay. uh, whether it would work with SSH or with the VS Code. It might, uh, it, I think it depends how people set it up. Yeah. And now it will, uh -huh, now, now it asks me, would you like to open the cloned repository? Yes, open it. And here it is on my VS Code. Yeah. And when I go on source control, somewhere here I can see, no, I need to click on a certain file. I can see somewhere the commits. Ugh. I should have practiced better how to do it on VS Code. But you can do it in your in in the in the exercise. The essence is that now I have the repository on my computer and you can choose. VS Code or command line or R Studio. Here, one of the three. And what are your goals? Your goals are uh, decide which repository you want to clone. Um, your fork or the original repository, actually, both will work because in this case, we are not pushing any changes, we are only cloning. We will learn how to create a new branch locally, how to create a new commit, how to switch between branches, how to merge them locally. And for those of you who have done that already yesterday, focus more on the question of where are the remote branches? How does it work? And down there you find more notes on this. When you, once you create these commits and branches locally, also compare compare the situation locally and on GitHub, and you will see there is a difference. So the all the changes that you create on your computer, they don't. you will see that they don't travel to GitHub. We will have to actively push them. We will do that later today. OK, before we go into exercise, just having a quick look at the notes, whether anything was confusing. Yes, should be cloned the origin repository or the forked version. If you have it, clone your own. But both will work here because we are not, all the changes that we do, we only do them locally. So it doesn't matter whether we are able or not to apply the changes on, on GitHub. All the rest of the exercises today will not depend on this. It will only depend on the techniques. So even if we mess it up completely, 
it's not a problem for the remaining two exercises. Good, we have allocated 25 minutes, which would bring us to, we would be back after the yes. exercise at the full hour. <laughs> and after the exercise, we will play the jingle, we will say hi, and we will remind you that there is a break afterwards. So uh, after the exercise, we will take a 10 minute break. So exercise until the full hour, 25 minutes, ask lots of questions. We will try to answer as we go. And in the meantime, I will practice with VS Code. And we will we will then afterwards, after the break later, show you maybe some of the tricky parts and we can discuss them. Okay, have fun with the exercise. See you briefly at the full hour for the jingle and the break start. Bye. And I think we are back. I was just trying to remotely control Richard's studio. So hopefully that worked. Uh, we are back on stream here, back from the break and back from the exercise. So hopefully that went well. We will see if we can lift some of the many good questions on the document here for discussion. I wanted to talk about two things before moving on. One is about branches. Um, because now that we have cloned the repository, and I will try to show that here on VS Code, we have, I was curious about uh, what branches do I see? So on my lower left corner of VS Code, if I click on the main branch, Um, during the exercise, I created one that where I added French toast. But then I see my like local branches, main, French toast, something else. But then there are also these origin branches. And these are branches that exist on GitHub. These are so-called remote branches. And here VS Code tells me that remote branch pointing to some commit, remote branch pointing to a different commit another remote branch. So actually, actually, I can actually see them here. And in VS Code, if I switch to a remote branch, let me maybe switch to the origin rather than lasagna. This is one that I created two days ago. If I switch to it, so if I click on it here, let's, let's see what happens. It, it created a local branch for me. Radovan slash lasagna. This is a local branch. And and I can make changes to it. And if I make changes to it, you will then also see that there will be a button that allows me to publish these changes back to GitHub. And in VS Code, this happens automatically for me. If you tried if you tried it on the command line. And uh, let me test this now inside VS Code, new terminal. In the command line, maybe you have tried to do git branch. The git branch will tell you what are all the branches that you have. Well, actually, what are the local branches that you have? And I have now four local branches. But in order to see all the branches, you really have to do git branch dash dash all. The remote branches, they are read only. I cannot really modify them, but the way to modify them was what I did in VS Code by creating a local version of them, which where I can do my work. And then later, if we want to, we can push these changes back. We will practice that later. One thing that I was trying to find out during the exercise, but I don't know the answer is in VS Code, how do I know, now that I have a clone of a repository, how do I know where I cloned from? And I admit that I don't know how to answer that. I know how to do it in the command line. So the way I would ask in, and if you know, please give us comments. On the command line, I would type git remote 
verbose. So whenever I forget where did I actually clone from, it will tell me that there is, let's make it a little bit more readable. It will tell me that there is an, a remote called origin, which is, and this is the address where I cloned from. And this is the shortcut for the address. So whenever on the command line, whenever you want to talk about the address, I can use these interchangeably. And there is a question on the document, what is origin head and what is origin main? And where did we see that? Was this when I did this? Maybe. Uh, head is in Git, whenever you see head, it's it's the position where you are right now. And this makes sense for those of us who remember still tape recorders because they have there's tape and there is a recorder head and you can think of version control as recording changes. And this is the position of the recording recorder head. It's maybe less intuitive for those who have never seen our cassette tape. But what is this origin head? Oh, that refers to the default branch on GitHub. So the default branch on GitHub, I can see from this that it is main. So this is now very technical, but I just wanted to answer that question. What else should we clarify before moving on? Oh, there was no jingle. Oh, no. OK. I'm still practicing uh, using these remote controls to, to the studio. Thanks so much for these questions. Maybe we are ready then to, I will move this out of my way, the VS code, but we'll return to it. And I will now navigate to the next episode, which is inspecting history. And we want, that's our goal now for the next 45 minutes. Here we are still working locally. Again, you can choose VS Code, Command Line, RStudio. You can also do it on GitHub. So if you prefer not to work locally, this is an exercise that you can do on GitHub. We will work with a repository that we don't know yet. It's written by somebody else. And here are a couple of the, the toolbox that we will practice here. Some of it we have seen yesterday, like how to navigate through a through our existing repository. And just as a fun warm up, we can try this Git history browser. This is just a fun tool to written where you can visualize the history of a project. And the repository that we will practice with is on GitHub. It's a, it's a Python project, doesn't matter. It's called Network X. I will open it up here. And for the moment, only watch, you will you will have the chance to practice in a little bit. So this is a code that does some network analysis in Python. The fact that it is in Python is not of importance for our exercise. This is a repository with 7,000, over 7,000 commits. And one fun thing I will try here is to open this page. And here with left and right keys, I, this is the readme file. If I'm if I navigate left and right, I can navigate through the history of this README file, and we can see how lines were edited and removed, and how things are changing. I really like how this visually shows the evolution of a of a file along a Git history. So that's just a warm up. We will um, learn or. <clears throat> Repractice some really useful techniques. One is to search through our Git repository. And maybe here I should take a step back and say that this is a different repository. So when if you are then on VS Code, make sure to 
uh, open a new window with a different project and maybe there is a better way than what I did. So we are not anymore in our recipe book. We want to really study this, this network X project. And if you are in a command line, like I'm down here, make sure that you are not inside an existing Git repository. So if you are, then step outside. We will create, we will make a new clone. And I will now, I want to show you these, some of these commands here in, I will show them in command line, but you can then later try it out on the command line or try it out in your, on GitHub VS Code R Studio. And the first step will be to make a copy, except if you are on GitHub, you can, you don't have to copy anything. You can really just use their repository. So I will create it, copy the clone. And again, we clone everything. to make sure that this is readable. It takes a few seconds. Because now suddenly it's a lot of objects, it's a lot of commits. And here I'm in this repository. The latest commit is 2ECE02. Is that the case? Yes, the latest is 2ECE02. And some of the tools that you will practice that will be uh, super useful is if you look for a certain text in the project. For instance, I want to find all the fix me's in this project. And you can even search case insensitive git grep minus i fix me it will list me all the files that contain the word fix me in this file and in this file and in this file etc this can be useful if you you are looking for an error message and you don't know where where in the code is it crashing Then you will learn how to look at particular commits. So if I want to have a look what happened in a particular commit, for instance, this one, I can look at it with git show if I know the identifier. You don't even have to type the whole identifier. Just the beginning of it is enough. I will try that. And it will show me when did it happen? So this was a commit from 2020. And what happened in this commit? Good. And the same, if you want to navigate to the same thing, the same thing exists on, on GitHub. So here's the same commit. What was there before? What was there after? Then Yesterday, we have seen this super, super useful uh, way of annotating a file, which on GitHub is called blame, unfortunate naming. But you can then try it in also in the command line, which will show you line by line uh, when was each line of the code modified last. And then something we have tried yesterday is to browse the history of a particular file and see how does a particular file look, how did it look in the past? And you will practice how to do that on GitHub or command line or any of the other tools. But now let me, let me explain you the exercise. So in the exercise, your first step will be to make sure that you are not inside another Git repository. And here is how you want to check. And I think we didn't here tell you how to go out of it, but I see the question on the collaborative notes. So thanks for asking that. And then if you work locally, you will clone this example repository. 
in this case, the HTTPS protocol will work. If you are on GitHub, you don't have to clone anything. And then we want to go one step further and we want to make sure that we all work on a well-defined particular version of this project, which happens to be, this is actually a tag, it's a release. So you will navigate your copy to that particular release. And once you have done that, we have some puzzles for you here and also a solution. You will first need to, in this project that we don't know with 7,000 commits, you want to find where in the code is a file that contains this text, logic error in degree correlation. And we can imagine that this, maybe we try to run it and maybe this is an error that we got. And then we know, want to know where does it fail. Then once you find it, try to find out when was this line of code last modified or added and find the actual commit that modified that line. And you can do that with this annotation with the, with the blame function. Here is not about who did it, it's more about when did it happen? What happened in that change? And then have a look at this commit with, if you are on the command line, use git show. If you are on GitHub, try to navigate to that commit and see what, what happened in there. And sometimes you want to then be able to, if you find, okay, there was a change happened in the past, I want to be able to get my project back to the state of how was it back then? When, when this commit was created. So try to create a branch, not from main, not from the latest commit, but a branch from, from the past, from that commit in the past where this line was modified. And then bonus question is, well, how would you bring your code to the version of the code right before that line was modified? We can imagine that maybe this was a mistake, not in this case, but if you know that a certain commit in the past changed the behavior, you, you want to be able to navigate your project back to how was it just before, and then you want to be able to navigate back to main. So this is the goal of this exercise. For those of you who have time left and are on the command line and want to try something more advanced, you can even read up, read on this optional part where about git bisect. So the, the git bisect part is, is optional. Our goal for the exercise is this green box, steps one to five. And we have allocated 20 minutes. Hmm. Yeah, 20 minutes, which means that we will be back 50 minutes past the hour. I'm just now checking also with my co-instructor if this was somehow clear or if we should clarify any step before sending people into the exercise. So this is an exercise you can do in groups, you can do on your own, you can do locally on your computer, or you can do it. I think you can do all the steps also purely on GitHub. Please let us also know how it's how it's going, like whether this goes well or whether this whether you have problems, and let us know about the problems. How is it, Bjorn? All good from our side? Yeah, I think we are covering it all. Then let the exercise commence, and we will be back um, ten minutes before the hour. And then together with Bjorn, we can summarize. We can then look at some of the tricky points before we take a longer break then. Good, have fun at the exercise. See you again in 20 minutes, 22 minutes. Bye. All right, we are back from the exercise. Um, information to Richard, I got an error message from my <laughs> remote control panel. So maybe people heard some jingle, maybe they didn't. And, but I think we are streaming at least the right screen. We have 10 minutes left. We got heaps of questions. And 
many, many, many good questions. Something that people observed is that actually some of the steps are not so easy to do in VS Code. Some of the steps are not easy to do on GitHub, especially for instance, when we ask you to create a branch, well, that doesn't really work on somebody else's repository. So if you if we wanted to do it, you would have to fork first. Um, the solutions that we have here, they are only for the command line. So this is work in progress, we know. We, many changes that we did to the lesson we did only last week. So there is more work needed. But what I will try to do here in the last 10 minutes before the, like a longer break, to go through some of the steps here on VS Code. And sometimes I will have to open up our terminal inside the VS Code and use the command line instead. There exist extensions probably for everything. We didn't ask you to install any extensions because we didn't want to make it more complicated. We wanted to make it easy to join this workshop. But one thing we might want to might do is we, we collect on the code refinery chat, we started collecting what would be really useful extensions for VS Code that we can recommend everybody. And I admit that I have very little experience. So I think I'm using it now for the third time in my life. But let me try to go through some of the steps here. And hopefully I will also have time to show some of, to comment on some of the questions on how to do certain things on GitHub. And the first step was to make sure we start from a well-defined version. And this was because the code is evolving and we want to make sure that this exercise still works. So I'm, I will not work on main. I will kind of downgrade my version to this, some past release of network X. And one way to do it, I can click here on main. Is that visible? I'm on the lower left here with my mouse point. And I can probably navigate to the specific release. What was it? 2.6.3. Here we go. So now it changed a little bit because now we are, we have traveled into the past. Now how to find the code, the line that contains this. Ooh, I don't know. I will try the magnifying glass. Logic error in degree. Uh, it found something good. It's in network X algorithms threshold PY. Good. And I can even open it up, the file. Let's do it, just that I don't forget the name. Find out when this line was last modified. Yeah, so that I don't know how to do it in VS Code unless I ask the command line. And I also admit, I don't know what happens on all of your systems. So if you click on new terminal, I don't really know precisely what will happen. What I'm hoping is that it opens some form of um, of a command line that you can type and that looks similar to mine. But now that I know the file name, I can do git annotate and it was network X algorithms threshold.py. It might be too tiny on my screen, but if I now hit enter, it's on on the very right side is the code and the left side is the metadata. When was it changed by whom, which date, which commit. And I could now with my arrow down or up, I could hope, hope to find it. One way to search through this is if I know what I'm looking for, it would be the forward slash. So now I'm typing on my keyboard forward slash. And now I can search for logic error, enter. And this is now a little bit hard to read because I try to zoom in and it's not big screen enough, but this is all one line. This is the code and this is the metadata. So the last, the line was last changed in this commit. 
I will keep a note of that commit. I will just write it down here on my paper. It's 90544B4. How do I get out of this? Oof. With Q. If I type Q, I should. Yep, I'm out. And now we can inspect the commit with git show git show 90544B4, et cetera, et cetera. And there I will see more details. I don't want to open it up now because I don't want to put other people's email addresses onto the stream and recording. We will edit this other person out. But then I would see what happened in that commit. And what what uh, two more steps. Yeah. One was create a branch pointing to the past when that was commit was created. Okay, let me close the terminal because that I can do without terminal. Oh, how do I go back here? Let me close this. If I know and remember the commit, one way to navigate to it would be again, click on the branch tag overview. And a nice way to do this is to create a new branch. Whenever I want to look around in the in the past to some archeology, span I personally like to create a new branch it will create a new label, a sticky note, but I want to I want it to stick to this past commit way, way back. Create a new branch from. And now I can type the commit. Nine zero. Wait a moment. Is it asking me for the name? I don't know. Now I forgot. Let's try again. Create new branch from. Uh, what happens if I type in the hash zero nine zero five four four before? And then I can give it a name, which is ooh, how should we call it? Old, old code. code. Old code. Enter. And now I have a branch called old code. I can navigate to it. I can go back to main. I can go back to old code. And the code that I'm looking here right now is the one as it was back then. And now for the final question, how would I do how do I bring it back to the to the commit just before 90544? One way would be I could open the terminal and type git log. Git log. Why do I see here this hash and not the other one? This is not what I wanted. This doesn't point to the commit that I thought it would. Okay, that, that's not what I wanted. It's pointing to another commit? It's pointing to 263. So it created the, it created the branch on on the commit that I was at, not the one way in the past. Not the one in the past, no. Okay, so here I will try to, to do that in the command line. And I see that we are basically out of time. I will use one more minute. And that is, if I want to create a new branch in the past, git branch, I can call it really old code. And now I can give the hash from which I wanted to create it 0 0.544b4. And how do I switch to it? Git switch. And it also, also it switched also VS code. And now if I do git lock, I see, so I don't know why that failed. This is what I wanted to see. This is the commit right before. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it would be if I wanted a branch just before, I could say Z nine zero five four four before, and then tilde one. It's the first parent of that commit. It would be the commit just before.
that was a quick tour. I think we are out of time. I don't want to eat into the break. We will be back in one hour. And then be before we move on to, to the next thing, which will be learning how to turn a project into a Git repository and publish it, we will debrief some of the questions that I didn't have time to, to comment on. Good to see you everybody in, in one hour. We'll be back here with Bjorn and for a little bit more Git. Looking forward. Have a good break. Bye. Okay. It works. I'm just remote controlling here the studio from a different country. Amazing. Welcome back, everybody, after the break. Thanks for the feedback. Thanks for the questions. I wanted before moving on, I wanted to comment that this was not an easy exercise, the last one. It was possibly too short time. It was also maybe cold water because after yesterday when we we were on GitHub, now suddenly we have to work locally. Some commands only work in the command line. It's a new environment. So this was really advanced. So I understand the frustration. We will we need to improve the the solution and the walkthrough to make it easier for everybody. But also now we can relax because the next exercise that we will do in 10, 15 minutes will be a lot easier. And everybody can do it and everybody will need this in their work. So it will get better. The other thing I wanted to say is that uh, we don't expect that you remember all the commands for all of these advanced techniques of how to navigate through a repository. But we wanted you to know that, that you know that this is possible. Now you know that these operations are possible. Maybe you don't need them now, maybe you need them in three years. But since you start using it, it will be possible later for you to, these kind, to do these kind of operations. It's not important to remember how to do it. You can look it up later. If you, you know where the episode is and you can later look up how to do it in detail, but we wanted you to know that these things are possible. I wanted to show one more thing before we move to the next episode. This is just demonstration because this was one question on GitHub. You just need to know that again, that this is possible that if I look at a repository here and I see main and the latest commit from two days ago, I can navigate to that commit. And you can then navigate to browse files. So top right, there is a button called browse files. And something is different now in the address. The address is now not anymore it will not show me the latest version, but it will show me a specific version. This is the specific commit identifier. And if you want now, you can replace it. So if, if I still remember the commit hash from before the break, it was 90544B4. I don't even have to type the whole thing. And now I can, I can navigate through the project as it was seven years ago. So that can be also useful. So many of the steps could have been done on GitHub. It wasn't easy. We need to improve the, the walkthrough. Yeah, and the, I, I see that the URL here is hard to read. It is very small, but the difference is that if the first part is your project, then slash three slash commit hash. You can then navigate into the past. It's like time traveling. And somewhere in the, uh, in, well, let me paste it. So let me paste it into the answers, then you can try it as well. Here we go. Good. We will now leave this Network X project. If you didn't finish the exercise, you can try later. You know where to find it. It is not important for the rest of today and it's not important for the for tomorrow.
So I will, I think I will close, I will move this away. Uh, yeah, I will move it to, no, not this thing, this thing. I will move the VS Code away. I will bring it back in a moment. One more thing that we probably mentioned, but I just want to mention it again, something that now that we are have a couple of different repositories, well, something I did is uh, on my hard drive, I created a directory called course and everything we create here, I will put in there and it's easier for me to find. And also I don't clutter my hard drive with different projects because we will now go to a different project. It will be, I call it my project. It's my own project. It's not on Git yet. I will bring it to Git and I will bring it onto GitHub. And if you want, it can be your real project, but note that you will have the choice of making the project public or private. So you make it invisible for everybody else. And if you don't want that, you can practice with a, with a small example toy project. So this is what I will do. Do you have a default license that you use when you publish a project? Very good question. Um, I have, I have in my little toy project. I created two files. One is a Python script, but then I start. I right away start with a license. So license is one of the first things I will add to a project. License and README. And, and often I go for open source licenses. For coding projects, I often choose MIT license yeah. if I just want to keep it as simple as possible. Mm. And we will talk more about licenses next week. So sometimes I want, I want to make sure that not only my project is open source, but also all the derivative work is open source and then I choose a different license. Yeah. But more about that on Tuesday. But let me navigate to the right place. And the right place is on the bottom of the document, how to turn your own project to a Git repo and how to share it. I will open it up in a bra in a, my browser tab. And here there is not very much to say. We will give you enough time to to do this, but I want to really explain well what the expectation is. The expectation is that if you don't want to share a real project of yours, it can be a small script. You can create a new directory called my project or whatever name, whatever name you like, put a couple of files into it. And this represents our own research project, our own master thesis or PhD thesis. And it is not yet a Git repository. And the two steps are now we need to make it a Git repository. And depending on which track you choose, you will learn some new commands. So for instance, on the command line, you will see you have to do a little bit more work. There are a little bit more steps to do. If you go for VS Code, it's less to do because it does lots of these the Git commands for you. Or you can do only using GitHub. In some of these steps, you will have to create a GitHub repository for the project. Again, if you go for VS Code, you don't even have to do that. It will create a GitHub repository for you. But at some point, it at some point it might ask you for to authorize your VS Code to be able to write to GitHub for you. And, and I did that, you have to do it only the very first time and I said yes to it. So now my VS Code editor can create and modify my own GitHub repositories because that's what I wanted it to be able to do. Scrolling back. Your, your goal will be make it a Git repo in one commit or a couple of commits as you like. They will be they will live locally on your computer, but then you also want to share this repository to GitHub or GitLab because the, the steps that we show, especially the command line, 
uh, is very transferable between all of these services. And that's so important to do because our ambition is that every coding project that we do will become, will end up as a version controlled project that is findable by other people. And after you are done, uh, if you need it for a certificate, take a screenshot of it. You don't have to keep it on GitHub. You can again delete it. So we, we don't force you to keep all of these projects there. And we have allocated 25 minutes, which may be, I think it's good to give people time to experiment also a little bit and learn how to share the code. And what we will do uh, when we come back from the exercise is uh, that we will discuss a lot. We will really open it up for lots of questions. We will try to have a discussion here with, with my colleagues and we will talk about after all of these things we learned, what is a good starting point, how to progress, what are the things to avoid? What are typical traps when starting with uh, Git or GitHub? Yes, exercise until 35 minutes past. Try it out. Let us know how it went. Follow the solutions if you need. And see you then again in 25 minutes. And then let's discuss a lot. Let's then spend the remaining time that we will have to clarify all of these questions that are left. Good luck with the exercise. See you in 25 minutes. Bye. Welcome back, everybody. We, how did it go? I will try it also on my side. We got lots of questions. That was great. So my plan is I will, I have this little toy project. I want to, I will try it as well using VS code. It will take only two, three minutes. And then I can comment on some of the questions that came up once I create it. So let me try that code here, code dot. It will start it at the place where I am. I will make this more readable. This is not on Git yet. And all I have to do is source control. I could initialize it. I will not even do that. So for those of you who did the command line, you at some point you had to type git init. And this is what would happen if I click the button, but I will not even do that. I will go straight to publish to GitHub, which will then initialize the repository for me. It will create a commit for me and push the changes to, to GitHub. Publish to GitHub. And I will first make it a public repository. And then later I will change it to private because there was also a question where can we, where can we switch this to a public? You can, I could change the name for my project to something more descriptive, public, all of the files. Okay. And here I'm following the screenshots that we have in the solution. Now it, it, created the repository for me on GitHub. It created a commit, it pushed the commit and I can open it up on GitHub. Ta-da. And here is my project. This first commit is a commit that I didn't even actively do. VS Code did it for me. Now to the question about one question about public and private. This, this is a public project. How can you switch? How can you make it private? And how can you delete projects? This is something we have been asked. So on settings, this is, you can do it in settings. In settings, you can rename it. You can do lots of things. Scrolling down. But I will go to the danger zone. In the danger zone, I can change visibility. So from public to private. And if I, if I don't want the repository anymore, 
I can also delete it. So if I, and it will still ask me, do you really want to delete it? There is no way back, please type the name, but then in few steps, it, it, it can be, it will be gone. Good. Now let me show you one more thing here. And that is, how is this linked now to the local repository with the remote repository? And where is this information? So I'll click on my Python script. And then I want to see, is this the timeline? No, this is the timeline. Where is the timeline? How do I see this one? How do I see the commits? What I wanted to see is the, the commit messages here on VS Code as well. Hmm. Do you know, Bjorn? No, I don't. I looked for that uh, uh, several times, but I haven't found. Somewhere we talk about timeline. So where is this timeline if, thing that we talk about? Uh, is a certain file tracked in Git open? Yes. Hmm. Should it be. It would be. Oh, can you go to the file browser view, not the Git view? Yeah, there. And there, timeline at the bottom. Ah, here we go. Thanks. OK, first commit. Good. Yeah. Oh. Brilliant. And that was hard to find for mm -hmm. me the first time. So there's the timeline, there is the first commit, but now where is this information locally? Where is this stuff? And in the command line, you could do, there is a hidden directory called .git. And this is just a reminder that when we when you create commits branches, it all goes in there, all the metadata is in there. This also stores the connection between this repository and the remote repository. If you want to disconnect the two, look for uh, remotes. So you can remove remotes. It will disconnect the two. And if I, if I on my computer would delete the dot .git, then this commit is gone. The history is gone. The branches are gone. I think just for demonstration, I will try it out. I don't know what will happen. Let me. So please don't do it. This is now dangerous. I will do it only only here on stream. I will remove this. No, I will not remove. This is dangerous. What I will do, I will rename it. Git to renamed folder. Because then I can rename it back. Then if you do a git status, I guess you get but it's not a Git folder anymore. Yes. So if I now like remove it or move it away, Git status. So this is not a Git repository, but I think VS Code didn't get the news yet. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering what happens here with the timeline because there shouldn't be anything now anymore. There should be. Oh yeah. So now now VS Code uh, code also got the news. It says tells that well this is not a Git repository. You need to initialize it first. And now there is no there is no timeline anymore. So all the all the local Git information was in the .git. Let me try the reverse. Rename folder. I move it back to .git. Ah. Uh, now. Now there is a there timeline is again. Mm -hmm. So that was good. What else is here? Any trouble here? Anything else we should talk about? What did I mean by disconnect? I meant disconnecting. Uh, OK, what do I mean by that? The connection, there is a connection between now the local repository and the remote repository. So that when I do local changes here on my computer, I can push them to GitHub. And if I if I or somebody else does changes on GitHub, I can pull these changes to my local repository. This is something we will 
do quite a bit tomorrow. Pull changes, push changes. And the connection between the two was this thing that we called origin, but I think we only mentioned it very briefly earlier. It's a placeholder for, uh, we saw that earlier when we cloned a repository. It remembered where, where we cloned it from. A little bit technical. I will now move away my VS Code to get more screen space. I will also move away my terminal, more screen space, and I will navigate. What I want to do now, I want to navigate to, to the last part and we will, so let's discuss a little bit before break. We will then take a short break. We'll discuss a little bit more later. I would like now to really talk about all the questions that you might have. So let's make this really a Q&A session. Ask everything about Git that you wanted to know, anything about yesterday and today. And to, to get these questions started, we have these two episodes, but there won't be any exercises of where we want to now discuss here some practical advice, how much Git is necessary. We showed you many things that are possible, but what is where should we start? What should we do then? And what are typical traps? So first, practical advice. And I will add the link also in the document so that you know where to find it. We are now here. So at the bottom of the document, And there are a few topics that people might be wondering about. And one is, um, let's talk about commit messages. So what makes commit messages useful? And we try to summarize here that a useful commit message, it's like, a, it's like an entry in a logbook. It's, if you can in one line summarize the change, but also if you can provide context for it. And sometimes it's hard to do it in one line. I find it quite a challenge to mm -hmm. write one-liners. So if you need more than one line, it's still good to try. Here is here is a good example. Uh, if you if you write it in in a uh, command line. Try to summarize the commit message in the first line. And why in the first line? Because, okay, let me navigate to, let me go back to the recipe book. Recipe book recorded. Because the first line is the one that I see here. Mm -hmm. It's good if it's somehow descriptive because then I don't have to click and I don't have to look into it to find out more. But if you need to give more context, more explanation, why was this done? What does it refer to? It refers to a discussion that maybe started in an issue. Then it's customary to do first line summary, one empty line, and then more context if you need to. And when we created commits on GitHub, let me try that on GitHub. Now I will modify something pasta. Let me modify this one. So when I do it on GitHub, I also have the option to give a short summary. Here, edit, I will edit the file. Well, we need more instructions, more instructions coming up. Let's preview the change. And when, when I commit, when I create the commit on GitHub, the top part is the first line. And this is the this this the empty line is the one between the two, and here is the more context. And this is not a very useful commit message because it only tells me which file has changed. It would be much nicer to say what has changed, what was the context there, why did I change it? Because providing context and here more context. 
you know, when do you have really short message, commit messages and when do you have longer ones? Mm -hmm. Most of the time I have short messages. I have the longer one if it's, if it could be, if it connects to something else, if it connects to a discussion that we had, if I need to provide this context or if it's a bigger change and I want to summarize wh what I did and why I did it so that people don't have to look through all of the change to, to understand it. But most of the time it fits into one line. How about you? How do you do that? I mean, like everything, it really depends on the project. So for, mm, I mean, for small projects that I'm just starting and are still chaotic, I mean, it's often really short. Sometimes it's even things like fix bugs or so on if I'm busy and it's just all thrown in things. Like for example, this control panel for the stream I've been working on. It's mm -hmm. so young and things are changing so fast that if I take the time to make a good commit message, it's not gonna matter by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just do whatever. But then there's other projects that are actually like out there and mostly work. So every change has a particular purpose. Like I'm adding a certain new feature to it. And then mm -hmm. I'll go into more detail. Also, it depends on who else would be reading it. Like if I'm contributing to someone else's project, I'll use the commit message to explain why I'm doing it and what mm -hmm. the reviewer might need to know. And they know I may as well do it there rather than write it somewhere else. Especially because when you open a pull request, it will automatically use the messages from the, uh, the commit by default. Right. If I have a pull request with only one commit, it will suggest me that this is the pull request title and it will suggest that this is the pull request context. And a good point about that, if, if you start, if it's your own project, it doesn't have to be formal. It shouldn't be formal. Maybe still good to write the commit messages in, in English because many projects start small and then they become lots of people and they live for a long time. But as, as for bigger projects and some of them are listed here, and maybe these are projects that some of you use like SciPy, NumPy, Pandas, Julia, ggplot. It can be interesting to browse these projects and have a look how do they do commit messages. And you will see that they are a bit more formal because they have to be. These are projects with hundreds, thousands of people. So then they agree on certain conventions of how to how to document uh, improvements, how to document bugs, how to document how to write commit messages which automatically create release notes. But we don't have to be that formal yet. But it can be still fun because it, you can browse them for some inspiration of of how do these really well established open source projects uh, communicate through commit messages. Yeah. If you take some of take some project you're interested in that's reasonably big and subscribe to its repository on GitHub, you'll start getting a flood of these kind of pull requests and messages and discussions that are coming in. And mm -hmm. this can be really educational to see how people do things. Like from subscribing to repositories and seeing how they've worked, I've learned many of the different techniques which I use now. So yep. I yeah, so I'd so for becoming better at things, this is one of the things I'd recommend. It's a great tip. Like if you want to become a better writer, you should read books. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's similar here. I think from all of these, uh, I want to point out one thing. It can be more useful to say why something was changed. It can be more useful than what has changed, because I can find out what changed. I can go to the commit. I can click on it and I will see it. Aha, uh -huh, these lines got removed, these lines got added. But sometimes it, it can be hard for me to tell why was this done. So the why can be more interesting. But 
And that's the last thing before the break. Let's take a break soon. Let the perfect not be the enemy of the good enough. Mm. At the beginning, let's make it just good enough. More commits, they don't have to be pretty. It's better than trying to do everything perfectly and then preventing you from uh, creating commits and sharing your work. And I suggest that we take a break, uh, maybe 10 minute break, because then everybody can think about what are the questions that you want to ask and please ask them. And then the remaining 20 minutes that we will have after the break, then we can talk about the complexity, how to, where to start with branches, how to deal with branch complexity, repositories, how to start and how to progress. Sounds like yeah. a plan. Okay, sounds good. So then let's be back five minutes after the hour and hopefully with lots of questions about Git. And if you want us to show something, please suggest it and maybe we can show something here. Let's make this on a bit of improv, improv session. Mm -hmm. see, you, see you all in 10 minutes. Bye. Okay, bye. Do you push the break button? Oh yeah, let me find the break button. Hello everybody, welcome back for the last 20 minutes, 25 minutes of today. It will be a discussion session. It will, it's a possibility to ask us lots of questions, which we can now here discuss. Maybe we can also show one or two things. So thanks so much for keeping this coming. I would maybe before moving on to branches, I would like to, we can talk about two things that came up. One was, when do you clone and when do you fork? How do you decide? Mm. I can comment, but maybe, yeah, Bjorn Richards. Yeah. And the cat is there, yeah. The cat is there. Yes. I would do fork. Schedule. I would fork uh, a repository that that seems like a bigger project. So fork it first and then clone my version of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I can say that I fork when, uh, when I somehow want to have it uh, and want to make sure that I don't lose even the fork, the copy. Um, uh, if I'm if I'm afraid that the central repository will I don't know disappear or something, then I just make a copy of it. Yeah. Or if I plan to contribute to it and make changes and keep those changes somewhere saved. If it's just about I want to run it only today, uh, then then I don't create a fork. Yeah, I didn't think about this. Uh keeping a copy in case the original changes, but that's a good point. Yeah, it's a little bit like a bookmark. Yeah. So if then the central repository disappears, it will not remove your fork unless the central repository is private. If at least it used to be like that, if the private disappears, it also removes all the forks. I see. Okay. But as a side note, how about a git ignore? When is that useful? How do you use it? What is it good for? Uh, it was asked somewhere. Don't git ignore here. Did you talk what, about what the... did you talk about git status before? And that... not so much because we didn't Thanks. spend we didn't focus too much on the command line. Yeah. I can do a quick quick demo here of it in my yeah. um, in my project. Git status. Oh, the, everything is, the working tree is clean. And what does that mean? Well, everything has been committed. Yeah. But what if I have now a, a file here? Give me an example for something that should not be in a Git repository. Um, test.py. What about? Uh, oh, sorry, I thought you, cats you was... see? Sorry, what was that? Dot PC. Ah. Yeah, but it's just a Python specific. Let's say I have a. Yeah. Okay, I, I will do something. I, I have a file called passwords, mm. txt. Okay, yeah. Git status. 
and I don't want to put passwords into the Git repository. I don't want to put passwords and sensitive information onto GitHub. And now if I type git status, I see it here. Git reminds me that there is this file. It's untracked. Do you want to add it? No, I don't want to add it. But I also, I don't want to be reminded. And if I, if I want Git to prevent me from adding it, I would list this in in a file doc, called dot git ignore. Uh, and now I don't want to spend too much time here. I can try to do it in VS Code. Code dot. Oh. So, yeah. So the point of git status is it will tell you what you're currently working on and what might need to be done. So for example, it tells you these are all files that you've done something on, but they aren't committed yet, which usually means you should commit them at some point. I can even do a wildcard. So anything that starts with passwords, please never put this into the Git repository. Uh, save. Now the thing is still there. It's like change color. Interesting. And if I go back to the terminal and I do git status, okay, there is ah, now the git, .git ignore, which yeah. I guess I should add to my git repository. How do I do that? I do it by doing. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, I need to go into this thing. Source control. Click add. Stage and commit message. and in the commit message would a good one would be ignore ignore files that start with password commit and back to here get status now it looks clean the password txt is still there it's not in my git repository and i, I will not accidentally commit it it will not let me i can even try oh git add password let me try to do that no, you cannot. Yeah, so it even warns you, mm -hmm. so you won't accidentally add it. Mm -hmm. So that was Git ignore. Typical thing to ignore is sensitive stuff, password stuff, yeah. big generated files. If like, for example, compiled if, files. Yeah, like if you're compiling code, you would ignore the results of the comp compiling stuff. If you're storing LaTeX papers, you'd ignore the generated PDFs and other intermediate files, and so on. For our code refinery web pages, we ignore the generated websites, and so on. If you have big data analysis kind of stuff, you might ignore all of the data directories because you store that some other way, for example. Mm -hmm. A little fun fact, if you zoom out here on the lesson down here, you can you can actually view the lesson in PDF format uh. in one big PDF page. And that's a generated file. We don't want to have that in the Git repository. We generate this every time we make a change to the repository. Mm -hmm. And this is not part of the Git repository. This could be something that is ignored. Yes. Back to the lesson, how about branching? Do you create branches? Or do you work with one branch in your projects? Oh, Bjorn, Richard? Well, um, I use a lot of branches. So, How do you keep them organized? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I try to give good names and start with my username and then a feature name. Do you usually work on big projects or small projects or? Uh, I work on small projects, private projects. Yeah. So. I'll just make this more visible here. For me, most of my projects are very small. Uh, I mean, I guess for everyone, you have few big projects and many small projects, which you might not even consider a project because it's so small. So for the small stuff, it's just working on one branch usually, unless there's a specific case when 
I need to do something like I'm actually testing something else. For bigger projects like small group things, well, if it's a small group but I'm the main developer and there's no one else that has time to review things, well, again, it's mostly with the main branch. But there's often times I'm doing something and I'm like, okay, this is such a big change. I know I definitely want someone to look at it. And then I would do the um, pull request workflow, like make a branch and actually ask someone, please take mm -hmm. a look at this. I really need your help. And then yeah. review. So start small, start simple. It's okay to have main branch. It's okay to put all the commits in there. And as soon as the project grows, so as soon as you have two people, more than two people, a few people, one thing you could consider is, and we will see that tomorrow in our exercise, one thing you could do in your project, in your research group, you could even decide that, well, we want to write protect the main branch. And we decide that the main branch is the one that works, is tested, um, and you write protect it. So nobody can accidentally modify it or push to it or commit to it, but yeah. you can then, and tomorrow we will show you how, you can then configure it so that all the changes have to be pull requests. And then at least somebody else looks at it. And it's not just to make sure that, it's not about just quality control, it's also about learning Then at least at least two people know about each change. And that's important in research groups. You want to make sure that if if one research group member student leaves, that the knowledge is not lost, that at least somebody else understands what, what was going on there. What happens if no one has time or like really only one person is working on a project? I guess then it's sort of too bad. Yeah. Like that's the problem itself. So I think there are two questions in this one question. One is what do you do if you are alone? and you have nobody else to look over the code. And maybe you can team up with somebody. It, does, it can be somebody who works on something else, but at least can look at the code part of it. Doesn't have even have to understand the, the science part of it. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can help them reviewing their code, but it can be hard. And then the other part of the question is, how about time? Because code reviewing takes time and it can feel like, well, this is not, you know, work or this is not coding, <laughs> but um, but it makes better code. It makes yeah. better understanding within the group. So we think it's time well spent, but we need to then co also convince, well, we need to allocate yeah. time for it. So it takes time. It's like, it's like reviewing a paper. Mm. It takes time, but the system is there for a good reason. Yeah. So when you were uh, like doing research and stuff like that, did someone usually review your work? Or did you have enough people to uh, do this? No, we were, we were not really, back then, we were not really using this code review. Everybody was committing to the main or master branch. We had tests, so we would notice when things wouldn't go well, and we yeah. would run these tests before committing. And at some point, somebody would notice that something changed and you would fix it. Uh, these days, also in the project that I used to work on during PhD, uh, we use code review. Somebody else looks over it. We have automated testing. We will show you that next week. So even when you look at the pull request, we can, we can see whether all the tests are passing or they are not passing. But this can be built up step by step. It's good not to add all of this machinery right from the start in small projects. Okay, we have 10 minutes yeah. left. I just want to see what else kind of topics we have here. And looking at questions, we have we could talk about staging and committing. Mm -hmm. I'm just scrolling down here and see what interesting topics. How how large should a commit be? What yeah, what is the what is a good size for a commit? Yeah, maybe let's start my with this one. My my experience is that a commit shouldn't be large than its trouble. So that small commits are best. 
Yeah, so it's probably better to do many small commits than than one commit every few weeks. Because if you do many smaller commits, you can always recombine them later. It is easier to combine than to split. If if you later you find out that some commit was a mistake, it can be easier to undo it when it was small, rather when it was one commit that touched everything. Uh, what what I try to do, but I'm not always successful, is that I don't try to not put unrelated changes to the same commit mm -hmm. and to the same pull request because that will it will simplify the review for the other person. It will also simplify the undoing. If we later realize that was a bad idea, then I can undo the bad idea instead of at the same time undoing the good idea that was packaged into the same commit. Right, yeah. Maybe in terms of like time, often I try to make a commit at the end of the day, mm -hmm. approximately. One per day, few per day, if, if all you do is coding. So a unit that you would not, not like to lose. Yeah. But I mean, does, does that imply you tend to do one thing per day? Correct. So then we need more commits because yeah. often I actually jump from thing to thing. I wish I would just work on one day and one thing <laughs> on a day. Yeah. I mean, like I've said, I think it really depends on the project size and what it is. So mm -hmm. we're teaching you some of the basics here. But how to apply it to your own work, well, that is something that you will figure out. And I mean, it's okay to do it wrong also. We talk so much about the right way to do things, but doing anything and then seeing what works or doesn't work is even better. I mean, that's how I've learned most of what I know by doing it wrong many times. So. Yeah, I fully agree. I, I want to have a quick peek here at the, what to avoid. Maybe there's an interesting topic that we could uh, talk about. Yeah, that's good. But there is a lot of text, but I think this is something that, well, many many will identify with. I The code is never finished. It's always unfinished. Mm -hmm. It's it, It's ugly. It's okay. Just commit. Share it. Nobody will judge. Yeah. Don't postpone it just because it's unfinished. I can oh, yeah, give some metaphors. So when we've been hiring people, I've had to look at a lot of repositories. And I'd say, so, okay, so this is like practical advice. If you're thinking, oh, I don't want to share ugly looking stuff because people will judge me. Well, when you're hiring people, you're doing judging. And I would rather see a few or maybe one really good project that shows this person knows how to do things well. And then a lot of small, ugly projects, meaning, oh, uh, yeah, like they're just like they're not just doing they're not too overly perfect. They're able to actually track stuff and keep it, mm. uh, you know, th they understand that. Wait, how would I say this? So they're not just showing their perfect thing, but they believe in openness for everything. And they know that it's better to share. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, if you look at the history and it starts ugly and gets better, that's completely normal also. Mm -hmm. And... I would never judge anyone for that. I would actually, well, I would judge them positively by thinking, okay, this person knows to start recording early as opposed to something that has one commit that's the final product and then mm -hmm. nothing else. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, relying on that for anything. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't mind at all ugly commits or ugly code. Uh, one thing I would maybe look at is how do people communicate? So how do they review other people's code? Are they, is it done in a nice friendly way? 
in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of communication in in issues and in pull requests and in pull request discussion. And these days we we often work collaboratively. Yeah. There's these last two good questions or last two questions that are good. Is there a way to do automatic git commit to avoid losing work? So once I solve some sort of thing that it would hook into an editor and on every save, it would do another git commit on like a work in progress branch or something like that. Mm -hmm. I haven't used that mm -hmm. or seen it again, but if you want, you can probably do similar things. Maybe another way to do it is you can run git add more often. So once you oh, do yeah, yeah. git add, it stores a copy and it's hard to figure out where it's storing, but it is actually mm, stored somewhere. And with enough work, you can probably find it again if you happen to completely mess things up. Indeed, that's that's how I often work. I use the staging. I stage often. Any time it's it's an it's an improvement, I stage it. But when I feel it is an improvement, but not yet a commit, stage, 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 and then a commit. Mm -hmm. I don't use anything automatic. Maybe now with AI, it will soon do these things for us. We will just well, we will, we will not even write code. It will write the code and do the commits. But um, so I don't use I don't use any automatic git committing. How about the joining commits? Uh, we have an episode on the more advanced topics, which we will not go through, but I want to show you where that is. So here the optional episodes can, if you're interested, have a look at what is this thing staging area and how can you undo recover from situations? And then you will learn about Git reset where you can do lots of these things like moving commits around, reordering them, joining them, moving them to a different branch. So all of this is possible. We should also not forget to copy the feedback form into our notes. Uh, yes. I'm just trying to find it. We have it somewhere. Okay, I almost have it. I will copy it in. But let's continue discussion. We still have five minutes, but I want Oh, somebody's on it. Good. Here it is. So tell us what went well today, what didn't go well today, what we need to improve for next time. And whatever we can fix already for tomorrow, we will. Yeah. Did you all enjoy this R Studio track? So we did it relatively late at night last night. Um based on feedback and seeing how many people it would help. Um, so we can't make all of these different tracks perfect, but is it worth it? So I'm adding a new pool there, um, helpful. Mm -hmm. And it is work in progress. I mean, you notice that some things are not totally smooth yet because some of the changes were last minute. Also, if you look at tomorrow's exercises, there is still work to be done. So to this afternoon, we will add some screenshots and solutions, but we have really interesting and real life exercises for tomorrow where we will collaborate. Those of you who don't have an exercise team or are not in an exercise room. So those of you who participate here on your own, you can still collaborate with us. So hopefully you got an email from me. If you signed up today, I will hopefully send it later. And then you, there, there are instructions on how you can join because we will need to add you to an exercise repository so that we can all collaborate inside it. Those of you who are part of a group and part of a team, I mean, lucky you. Thanks also to the team leaders and to those who help the local rooms and the groups to who help out. 
especially because we try here really new material. This is also not so easy for all the uh, team leaders and helpers. It's really appreciated. Yeah. Should we write news for day two and what people need to do to prepare for day three already before we go? So I listed, we did the things which are listed on the schedule. We added links to the specific episodes we covered. Tomorrow we do a different lesson. It's called Git Collaborative. It's basically the same kind of things, but it's really all about working on these bigger projects together. So basically how to, like a, a lot about pool request and central repositories and reviewing code and stuff like that. Is there any extra preparation for that? Can it all be done through the GitHub web interface or the other um, or the other methods? Yeah, the, it will build on tomorrow will build on today and on yesterday. So for those who want to work on the command line, we assume that you are able to to clone and you are able to push. And today we practice these two things. So in other words, for, for those on the command line, we we hope that either the SSH protocol or the Git credential manager is working. It will be possible to do everything tomorrow only on GitHub. It will be also possible and relatively easy to follow on VS Code. If you are already curious what the exercises are, you can find them on top of this page, we have a list of exercises you can browse, but you will see that there is a lot of details missing, but the big picture is there. A list of exercises. So tomorrow we will collaborate within the same repository, but then we will also learn how to contribute changes to repositories that belong to other people. What, How to do it technically, but also how to do it, like what is the etiquette there? And then we practice code review how do how can you review somebody else's code how can you give suggestions to changes and how can we then implement these changes without without having to open a new pull request we will we will practice this inside the same pull request we will have a discussion and we will have these suggestions and improvements and that's a really important technique whether you are on github or on gitlab yeah and we really have designed this where like our idea, like we need to teach the local things, VS code, command line, and so on. So our idea was we start with day one GitHub, and then we start showing the local things other days. And even though we have these other paths there, unfortunately we can't support everything as well. But we hope that we give a base where you can go to other things and follow up yourself. Yeah, I'm really looking forward. So I think that's all from me. How about a lot a big thank you to Bjorn and Richard and everybody else helping. Yes. Any final words from, from you two? Not really. I guess it's time mm -hmm. we should get going or Bjorn. Yeah. Uh, nothing more to add really. I think we're covered out of the ground. Yeah. Good. Thanks everybody. Really looking forward to tomorrow. It will be exciting. And yeah, exciting lesson coming up. Yes. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.